Hello and welcome to Audiovisual Cultures, the podcast exploring arts and cultural production. I'm Paula Blair and I'm really happy to be joined this time by Ian and McKenna, who talks to us about his moving image practice. Many thanks to members at patreon.com forward slash AV Cultures for your continued and much appreciated support. The podcast is free to access but not to make and distribute. Please do listen to the end to find out more ways to be part of Audiovisual Cultures. For now, enjoy the discussion with Ian. I'm Ian Amakana. I'm a filmmaker from Belfast. I've exhibited video installation work and written for Circa Art Magazine a few times. I had the pleasure of looking through quite a lot of your work because you've been putting it on YouTube, a lot of the work that you've had in installations and in film festivals. That's really exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you've been mostly making short form films so far, is that right? Yeah, at the moment I would like to push on to more long form projects and I've been writing a couple of things that are beyond anything that I've done so far. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons is it's like a financial, mm-hmm. it's part financial because you can only afford so much. Short form's good for audience attention and things like that when you're putting on exhibition or if it's online. You know, mm-hmm. people tend to not watch too much for too long. Especially in the sort of the films that I like. I'm a big fan of slow cinema and that sort of thing. Oh, so in this sort of culture, it's a bit more difficult. I think then it might be useful to try and get an idea of the themes and issues that come through in your work by talking, first of all, maybe about one of your most recent films that you uploaded. So last week you uploaded a really short animation called Screen. Yeah. I find that one really striking, visually as well as the audio. It's really fascinating, we film. It's only about 25 seconds, is that right? Mm -hmm. I really love the way you focus on small details through your work. And you've got this recurring image of a hydraulic hospital bed being Mm -hmm. raised. And so there's this sense coming through it. But you, you use the shapes of things and they're quite abstracted but it's still clear what they are you know it's very minimal very pared back but I find it really packed a punch yeah it really conveyed a lot of isolation and and it was quite intense but there's also this idea of busyness and there's a lot of other stuff going on in the sound if you're happy to talk about what it is you're exploring in that well screen I sort of view it as like a, an in-between film for me in terms of where it lands with my work. I had a film I did a while back and in that there's the bed raising. But I'm also, I, I've written a short film that I sort of had in mind. Uh, it hasn't been made yet, but it's close to the sort of aesthetic look of screen and really pared back images. And I kind of wanted to just have a teaser, almost have something in mind that would introduce the next short film well. I plan to shoot that short film if it gets made in black and white. So for me, I was kind of just testing out different ideas. I like just focusing on the one detail Mm -hmm. of something. I'm a big fan of Theodore Dreyer's Passion of Joan of Arc in that film. There's a lot of just, it's like a bed against a wall Mm -hmm. or a cross against a wall. So that sort of thing. That was a big influence as well, not only in screen, but in previous work. Focusing on the details and on singular objects, I guess they're meaning to me or what people can take away from them. The previous one you did, was it the rag tree where yeah. it's as if it's in a hospital? Is that the one where I read you, you used a faulty camera for part of it and that's some of the technical um, things you had? Is that right or is that a different one? I think I used a faulty camera for... Oh, it's the... Uh, the the yeah. previous one in Okiko. Yeah, the one about the keening. Yeah, it was yeah, very yeah. interesting um, as well. I used the same camera, but I, I bought a, another one for Ragtree. With Okiko and I, I used a faulty camera, this old analogue Sony small camera. It fitted perfectly with the themes of mortality and illness, you know, something being wrong. I try and find a lot in my work. But then with Ragtree, I, I bought the same camera because I love the night mode on it. Mm-hmm. And I, I thought its effect was brilliant. And I, I'm a big fan of, you know, just analogue. All those, like, 90s and early 2000s, like, <laughs> analogue films that came out. Most of them are kind of silly, but I still like them. You know, like the Blair Witch Project and yeah. things like that. Yeah, I bought, I bought a new, or not a new one, I bought another one that worked fine and I shot on that for Ragtree. And those are films that, uh, quite a few of your films, they're thinking about grief. 
the idea mm-hmm. of losing somebody and who's left behind and how it affects mm-hmm. them. Yeah. Themes around remembrance and the rituals you go through when you visit a grave or you're at a wake or yeah. something like that. Yeah, I was researching a lot in the last few years into, you know, old Irish culture and the culture that's carried through into, like, nowadays, or that's just sort of surviving as well, and interested in how it changes over time and that sort of thing, and that informed the Keenan work I did, you know, Keenan's to lament the deceased. It's a archaic ritual, like, usually a, a woman would perform it, but it kind of died out. There's a number of reasons why it died out. The Catholic Church weren't too big of a fan of women having mm. a sort of power yeah. over the body. Because mm. cleaning would take place over the deceased at a wake, usually. Mm. They didn't really like that. I think there was an association there with sort of pagan rituals. It goes back a long way, so it was an odd thing. But I had met the, in the lead up to that, because I was trying to find someone to perform it, who eventually turned out to be Frances Quinn. She mm-hmm. did a great job. Someone to speak Irish as well, because mm-hmm. that's what it is. I had met the Armagh Rhymers, and I remember the man, I think his name's Dara, he was talking to me about, you know, how it's just a human response to death. Yeah. And I really sort of took to that, and that's really what I was getting at. I wasn't trying to, there was no, like, sort of, I guess, like, national sense. It was just, I, I was really attracted to that sort of mm-hmm. feeling of mm-hmm. a pure expression of grief. When I wrote Alka Kill and the Lament, I was sort of writing it from a couple of different perspectives, sort of informed by my own history and then my people, you know, that have passed away and things like that. I did a little bit of research about caning years ago. It was described as a cry beyond crying. It was this sound that just came from within. Uh It didn't necessarily have a particular... There weren't any necessarily words to it, or it it was just something that emerged. It was the feeling that could emerge through sound from the body. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. With my one, I suppose, it was like a sort of poem, Mm -hmm. I guess. But I I did, you know, when me and Francis Quinn were were working together on that, I told her if you're getting into those sort of moments where no words are really coming up yet, Mm -hmm. you know, just kind of like roll with it. Really uh, welcome those kind of organic, as you're describing, like inner, not even just mumbles or, you know, Mm -hmm. cries almost. Yeah. I think there's a few moments in Ocotone where it's like that, but Mm -hmm. uh, for the most part, it is word. Going back to like the sort of history of it, I think there's like a lot of links to old Jewish and Arab cultures as well. It's really interesting. It's fascinating. Where's the point of origin? Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 It came up actually in a previous recording I did with an artist who's also based in Belfast. She was born in Iran. She was talking about practices that were really quite similar from her parents' culture. Uh It feels there's something just quite natural about it in a way. It's a natural response to grieving. I think visually that one because that's one where is that the night vision you use where it's quite Mm -hmm. black and green and then you've got these distortions where it's breaking up yeah, with a lot of my work as well, it's kind of just circumstance. Again, with the camera, it was this faulty camera and it just suited the look and it suited the mood. The night vision really, it'll only light up what can be lit. So if you just put a figure against a wall and you sort of cast the light across her and put on night vision, it's very simple, but you can it can be very effective to go alongside the words. Sound-wise, there might be some like patches where it's a bit iffy, Again, that's just recording because we had recorded in Accidental Theatre mm-hmm. in a few friends. Mm-hmm. It's right at Shaftesbury Square yeah. and cars go by. So I was doing a lot of post just to eliminate those uh-huh. uh, signs in between what Francis was saying. It came back around and worked mm-hmm. in my favour because it suits what the camera's telling mm-hmm. and uh, what she's saying as well. I suppose these themes keep re-emerging in other pieces. So the rag tree one, it has the bed images again. Again, but you've also got it seems like a young man visiting some sort of memorial and tying a rag on a tree yeah I was going down the rabbit hole again there with old traditions and cultures for a lot of people it still happens probably more so than the act of caning if someone's unwell they'll visit a well like a holy well and mm. dip their rag or part of something that maybe belongs to that person and tie it to a rag tree it's an act of hope I guess 
maybe it falls into like a prayer or sending a message something to someone. I guess there's something spiritual there is what I'm saying. I'm not too sure of the history, but there's plenty of holy wells in Ireland, especially mm-hmm. along the south coast, I believe. There's just dozens and dozens, and some of them are just being lost over time as well. Filming something like this is just nice, like a simple act of documenting an act that maybe is dying out. Yeah, because there's a lot of focus on removing the grate and the close-up action of the hand dipping into Mm -hmm. the water repeatedly. It's almost like a cleansing part of the ritual. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it's a feeling of if we separate it from any religious connotation for a moment, if it's an act of trying to feel like you're doing something when you feel powerless in a situation, if somebody isn't well or maybe in the process of dying and you're feeling quite helpless about that, you know, it's yeah. maybe doing something is what helps. Yeah, I think you're right. Just doing something like a simple act like that, whatever it may be, it doesn't have to be connected to a religious or, you know, it doesn't have to belong to old Irish culture or anything like that. It can just be, as you said, like a simple act of going to get someone some sweets or and bringing them to the person who's unwell or just visiting someone and talking to them and distracting them for a period of time. You get more directly into following a young person dating with grief in your fiction film Removal. That was yeah. a, a longer piece. Is it right that you had it at quite a few film festivals? Yeah, I got that into... Because of, again, the Irish themes that were coming up in it to do with wakes and one part of it, the aftermath of a wake, uh, I decided to submit it into a lot of Irish film festivals. So I got into a few in Dublin, and then there was one in Burr. I got into a few here. I think people who were maybe deciding on it here were able to connect to it, you know, a bit more than maybe if it was abroad or Mm -hmm. or something. So it's following a young man who seems to have a job as a removal person and (laughs) (laughs) removing these religious icons. Oh, God. Which he manages to accidentally damage some of them. So there's quite a pointed thing about maybe broken faith and the iconography and stuff. So he finds out about his father being taken ill and he seems to just know that he's gone. Yeah, it's a sort of premonition. Yeah. Yeah. But yes, I see what you mean about really appreciating slow cinema in that it's a very quiet yeah. film and it's very still. And yeah. so when there is action, you really notice it. But yeah. yes, it's very considered and it's very internal type of film, yeah. I think. Definitely. That's what I was really trying to go at as well. Like, I think the average shot length and removal is quite long. There's some shots that go on for over a minute, which mm-hmm. is kind of wild, I guess, for a short film. Yeah, I was looking at a lot of poetic cinema. I'd watched a lot of Kira Stami's work. Mm-hmm. The, uh, right. I think he's Iranian. He's he does, yeah. brilliant. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I was watching a lot of him. That makes sense because there's quite a lot of journeying on roads in your mm-hmm. film and removal. Yeah, yeah. So, yes, yeah, yeah. so that, that, that comes to me. think about that, yeah. Yeah, the right. landscape, uh huh. Whereabouts did you film that one? Down in South Armagh. We have a place down there. But it was good to film down there because there's not many people like affecting the roads and stuff. Yeah, um, you had clear runs. Yeah, and there's a hill nearby called Dead Man's Hill. That's a big part of the film. Yeah, there's a woodland that's very key in it. Yeah. He receives the news that something sudden has happened to his father and then he sort of just runs away from it, the main character. And then later on, after time has passed and after the wake, the main character is played by my friend Oshin. Mm-hmm. Um, he uh, returns to that spot and... I guess it's like a appreciation for what it means in a weird way. You know, you get like when places hold such meaning to you, sometimes, well, for me at least, I don't really hold any resentment or bitterness towards them. I just kind of look at them and that's what the main character does. So there was a bit of that because mm-hmm. I, I wrote it as well. There's a sort of dig a wee bit deeper. There's when he returns, he sees a communication tower and I was kind of linking into uh, earlier in the film where a phone goes off. Yeah, I was trying to pick at something there. I wasn't too sure at what exactly, but mm-hmm. maybe like a connection isn't tangible, isn't you can't see it or feel it, so something like that. It does feel like a lot of your films are trying to work through things. Do you feel like that's how your filmmaking is? Is yeah, just yeah. trying to work through those things that you're... Yeah, especially the, the short films as well, and or the, the Keenan film I did. I find the writing really cathartic. 
I guess they're just releases of, you know, what I went through in hospital. I've been talking about this to a few friends and stuff as well. With filmmaking, it's a bit more difficult for me to find a release in filming because it's not really about being creative when you're on set. You have to get the job done. Filming and parts of editing for me are, I don't really find a creative release there. Mm -hmm. It would be more maybe in like the writing Mm -hmm. and uh, that sort of thing. You know, I think for performers, they can go on stage and get that instant release Mm. or like painters or people who are like expressing themselves but with filmmaking I think it's only when you're maybe writing or viewing films but for me I find a release in that. So that's the tools to get it done? Yeah yeah I think there's no room for emotion on set you kind of just need to get the job done. At least if you're, because it's those short films, I produce all of them as well. I wish I didn't have to, but it's me running around and getting the props and stuff. It's yeah. just getting the job done. It's all probably really important practical experience though, because hopefully that sets you up if you want to expand in that sort of career, because you're still very young. You've got options then for what area you'd want to do, because you're really multi-skilling at the moment. With yeah, everything. yeah, it's, I suppose it is good. I have to remind myself of that sometimes. Yeah. That's it. You know, when you're taking on the reins for a lot of the tasks, you obviously learn a lot about them. So mm. yeah, it's good experience, and I try and removal was a it was a tough shoot I felt at the time I hadn't done a good enough job directing it and things like that but I guess that's just kind of part yeah no I suppose if you're but if you're having to wear all the hats at the same time then realistically you know and you're a very young filmmaker and it is a very difficult job to do so to have made a 17 minute film doing that much of the work by yourself at your age that's pretty impressive in itself I mean honestly I've seen worse I'm not damning you with praise it's a good film but you know I've seen a lot worse by more professional people so don't put yourself yeah. down don't be hard on yourself I think all of us throughout our whole lives we're always constantly learning it's good to be able to look at things and go well I can do better I will do better next time because you learn yeah. from any mistakes but not that you made mistakes it's a really tight film it's just more just accept that you're young and you're gaining experience and you're doing it really well so there's a lot of heart to take from what you're doing and it's very brave to do a lot of these themes as well because you're looking at things that are quite mature for your age I think your generation are quite an interesting group because you might have some more maturity because of things going on in your lives that people are just a few years older and you might not have. So I'm quite interested to learn about what's going on with people your age at the moment in their very early 20s. Yeah. It's hard to know what's going on, to be honest. <laughs> I'm in my own little world or whatever, but uh, I feel like a lot of people my age are coming out of uni and stuff and they're just kind of trying to figure it out. And I think that can be dull for a lot of people. That obviously comes with a lot of pressure and anxiety and that mm-hmm. sort of thing, but hopefully people figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think any of us really, truly figure it out. <laughs> you just <laughs> you just survive, you just get through. I think anybody who ever says they've got it all sussed out, I think they're probably lying, to be honest. Yeah, I yeah. think you're right. <laughs> is it okay to ask you about film education um, sure. having been a content provider in inverted commas for film education and having had a background in film education you told me before that your film education was interrupted because of health issues is that right yeah. you're going through a period it seems to me from the outside of self-educating and just doing it you know learning by doing it is that yeah. fair to say I made films before, I went to, yeah, I'll take it back, I went to Manchester for a year in 2016, 2017, studied filmmaking there. But before that, I was making films, I I did move an image at school, and I made films outside of that. And then, uh, yeah, I came back and was in hospital for a bit. I don't know, I guess I just had my camera lying about it and just Mm -hmm. started filming, and I sort of had these images in my head, so I started to make them happen, Mm -hmm. I guess. I've been on a few film sets as well, so... Mm -hmm. I guess I have that experience, but for me, I've definitely learned the most just doing it myself. I do wonder how the experiences compare. It was quite heartbreaking in a way when I was teaching. I taught briefly at the University of Salford, probably at the same time that you were in Manchester. And oh, right, yeah. Yeah, and I was a theory person attached to a new film production degree. 
you know, we had so many excited, really enthusiastic young people who all wanted to be directors, producers, cinematographers, all that. Yeah. And telling them, yeah. that probably at the end of your degree, you'd have to go in as a runner anyway because it's yeah. like, you know, it doesn't yeah. fast track you. Yeah, that's right. You know, I always wondered about just the ethics of that, you know, film production education that's formalised and institutionalised because... Yeah. I worry that a lot of young people are going into it thinking that they're going to come out straight away being Tarantino or whatever, ironically, because he's not educated at all in film, apart from going to the cinema. And I feel like that's what was lacking is they're not going to the cinema, they're just watching stuff, you know, watching TV, which is fine, but then thinking they're going to move to Hollywood or something when they're finished, and that's not very realistic. So I was just wondering if what your experience I mean you're still in the middle of it so we're finding out but yeah you know your different experience is just getting in there and just doing it anyway yeah um, I had good experience with my course Mm -hmm. I mean would I go back and do it I probably wouldn't I remember uh, one of the course leaders said at the start of it go and watch some films go Mm -hmm. to the cinema that was memorable you know because I go to the cinema a lot I watch a lot of videos. I watch a lot of films. That's a big educator. Like you mentioned Tarantino. He, I think he worked in a TV rental store for yeah. years. And he just watched like Korean films. And then Reservoir Dogs was yeah. me. <laughs> Watching films is a big part of it for me. I guess some people are going to e and and are going to maybe filmmaking courses because they don't really know exactly what they want to do yet, generally. Maybe some people are going to network. But uh, yeah, film industry is a bit of a tricky one because, again, as you're saying, it's like you graduate from a filmmaking job, but you're still going to have to take up an entry level in the film industry unless you've got a connection. I, that's a bit random to be honest. I don't think people read enough about what their course entails. They usually set out the course detailed enough before you enter it, so you'll know what you're sort of getting into. But I think people don't pay enough attention and there's a lot of pressure to just go to uni generally, not just for filmmaking. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you've got to get on your life and then further down the road, that can cause a lot of problems Mm -hmm. when you realise that maybe it isn't for you. (laughs) I remember one moment we were being asked who wants to direct. This was when I was at Manchester. And I was surprised how many people didn't put their hands up, you know. I just took it as a given that people wanted to go to the filmmaking course and direct short films, but a lot of people, I guess, maybe didn't know yet, or maybe they were attracted to other things, but thought we were there to make films and stuff, but there's a lot of other different roles. Yeah, there's a huge amount to do. I think life experience is probably, in a way, more useful, or being educated in other areas can be more useful, is what I'm hearing Uh from listening to other podcasts that have a lot of people who fill all kinds of production roles and it's just so fascinating the amount of different things the amount of different expertise that goes into making one program or one film yeah there's so much i worked in the art department for a while there there's so many different departments Mm. and pre and during and post there's a lot of moving parts so yeah there's a lot going on you'd be surprised especially on those big productions it's gigantic where are you at the moment do you have to hustle for work is it a combination of your own projects and working for other people or how does it work for you at the moment the last job i had was working in the art department in the summer well film wise and then i I did a little bit of invigilation after that I wish that I had a, a more steady job or I wish that I got paid for what I want to do film-wise. I don't really make too much money off my own films. I have a contact who's just like production designer, so I've worked for him and usually he'll just phone me up if he needs some spare hands, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. I kind of just want to focus on my own thing, but then I get sidetracked and I need a bit of money as well, yeah. so then I have to go and do you know, how it is. I'm hoping maybe to get a more steady job, I guess. But I would like to do something in and around what I'm interested in, at least. Mm -hmm. Is it okay to ask you about the Salt House? Yeah, go ahead. So this is a short documentary you've done with the artist Sharon Kelly, who's got, I think it's today, the day we're recording, at her exhibition's opening in the Golden Thread Gallery. That's right. Is it okay to say that that's your mum as well? (laughs) Right. (laughs) It's a really beautiful wee film. Thank you. 
And her work is really stunning as well. Are you happy yeah, to um, tell us a wee bit about yeah, that? She, yeah, she's done a great job. Yeah, that documentary just came out of nowhere. I came back from, I had a residency in Hong Kong. Oh. And, uh, I came back from there and I was talking to my mum about her show and stuff. And then I just sort of had the idea that I envisioned there and then I could make something for her. So then I uh, started piecing it together. The show looks great. My mum's such a going beyond art and film. She's such a big influence, obviously, in my life. Mm. So uh, it's nice to just make something for her. Mm -hmm. I was lovely watching it because what she's doing is she's drawing in charcoal on translucent paper. So you get this sense of how delicate this is. (laughs) And the charcoal's just sitting on the paper. It could slide off at any moment. So there's yeah. a sense of how difficult it is to work with these very delicate materials. And so I think you've really picked that up in the camera work. You've got a lot of different focal ranges going on. So yeah, it's really yeah. well lit for it. You just really capture that precarity through the proximity, the close-ups and everything. Thank you. Yeah, I was filming that on three different lenses. I have a 15 and a 30 and then a 60. So they're nice sort of ranges to work with. Now, my mum's doing some really interesting things with Salt House audio work, you know, in terms of how the medium she's working on connects to the subject matter. Yeah. And memory and, you know, how fragile it is and mm-hmm. how fragile the work is. I've been installing with my dad and mm-hmm. it's very, very tricky. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> It's a big so, responsibility. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then mum's texting her every five minutes as well. So <laughs> <laughs> it's really lovely subject matter because that's really into her own childhood, isn't it? Yeah. This image yeah. of this salt house. But there's something very tenuous about that memory that mm-hmm. she seems to have. And there's photographs. It's yeah. really lovely. Yeah. Well, I guess with a lot of my mum's work, it's contemplative of events. I think she's going a wee bit further back than usual, maybe, with this one, to do with these images that she found of her childhood. She does a great job of articulating events, serious events, uh, that's going to her other work as well, with respect and like, how they should be treated. And she speaks brilliantly to grief and silence of it. For me, that's been a big source of inspiration that I look to as well. You know, because she did video work, she did animation. These are things that I look to as well as references. Yeah, and growing up around her, my dad as well, who's an artist, is I think it just kind of rubs off and you perhaps look at things. If you're going about a project or visually, I'll, I'll, I think there's a lot of lost and influence from them and how they compose events on paper or on a canvas, you know, mm-hmm. so. Do you want to say anything about the residency then in Hong Kong? Because that sounds very exciting. Sure. Yeah, I was there for a month. Months ago I applied because I was wanting to go away somewhere and I thought, well, I might as well do something with a, like a residency. I hadn't done one. And then months ago I had applied, like the start of the year pretty much, for this Tong Lai residency in Hong Kong. And then uh, over the summer, things just kind of started to kick off over there. So it was kind of interesting mm. going into that. You know, because I wasn't I, I wasn't aware of what was really happening in Hong Kong. And I wasn't really too public, I guess, at the time when I had applied. Yeah, and I, I landed in Hong Kong. And it, it wasn't too bad, to be honest, but it was just interesting to be there at that time. So this is a time when there's major protests happening yeah I was, I was there pretty much for the month of october mm-hmm. and uh it was strange because i on the flight over i had just finished the fountainhead by ayn rand and that's all about the individual against the collective mm-hmm. and uh, i loved it <laughs> and then i arrived into this place where people are uh, fighting for their individual rights mm-hmm. it's not the same thing but yeah, against but... this sort of big mass it was very odd how it like together but mm-hmm. yeah. what did your residency entail then for the most part i wrote I've been writing a script for a while now. Well, I finished it. Uh, so I was writing that, and then I made some installation work. And then I had a show out there in this venue called uh, Floating Projects. So I had a show there. I presented my video work, mm-hmm. you know, which I just had handy. I hadn't shot anything new. And then I did an installation that I titled Bed. And it was just made up of these plaster casts, plastic cups that I collected while I was in the hospital. Nurses would put tablets or mm-hmm. things into them, and you would take them out. Over the course of the hospital, I just started collecting them. So I, I cast those and made a like a split bed and uh, nice. just laid it out on the floor. I kind of disconnected from other. I was like a spectator to what was going on in Hong Kong. I didn't really want it to... I wasn't too interested in it. So I, I didn't really let that interfere with what I was doing, to be honest. With the video work and the installation, again, it kind of falls along to where I am creatively. I, I didn't really want... Maybe outside forces made their way in and I didn't realise with the mm-hmm. installation, but 
for me, I, this was to do with myself. There was no, for me, influence from what was happening in the Hong Kong. But I suppose because you're, you know, a young person who's been through quite an ordeal, that's a lot to work through in itself. Yeah. And, yeah. I find myself in my head a lot, yeah. And there's an overwhelming amount of stuff going on in the world in general at the minute, so it's really difficult to... If you start getting really in, interested and angry and caring about one thing, well, what about all the other millions of things going on? So it's not a bad thing to be introspective. Yeah, it's it's just overwhelming, to be honest, what's happening. I don't really know what's going on anymore. I guess it's always been like this, but when you go through, I guess, something traumatic and then you come out the other side and you're looking around and you almost think the world will be peaceful, but it isn't. It just keeps going. Do you think you're trying to find some sort of peace in yourself? Um, Maybe it's not as active as that, but... Yeah, I guess I would like to. I think things kind of hit me last year, almost like a delayed thing, because I, I had a lot happening when I was out of hospital. But then I think things really struck me last year, and I, I almost became aware of that towards the end when I came back from Hong Kong. I think Hong Kong was great for like breaking the routine. That's great getting onto a residency like that. And you seem to have been doing quite well at getting your work exhibited in Belfast and a little bit beyond as well. Yeah, I've been fortunate because I, Peter Mutchler is my godfather and he runs the uh, PS Squared mm -hmm. space, so I've known him a long time. I got out of hospital, I had all these videos and I kind of wanted to do something with them. I showed for a few days in PS Squared when it was on North Street mm -hmm. and then I thought, to be honest, that was kind of the end of that. Right. You know, it was just, it was a nice way of wrapping it up. But then, I don't even remember too much of what happened. But I, then I, I was able to get the Crescent only a few months after. And I did like a complete new body of work, mm -hmm. pretty much within two months. And that was the Bakakun work in the Keenan. And I was really like going for it then. And then after that, it's been kind of like the itch you can't scratch, you know. I really like showing and making work. So it's frustrating because I'm trying to push things on. And it's been difficult to get shown places and things like that. But, yeah. yeah, it's patience. But, yeah. It's a lot of hard graft and patience. Keep at it and see how it goes. You've done quite a lot in quite a short space of time. So yeah. be pleased with that. Yeah. Do you feel like you're exploring a sense of a connection to Irishness or Irish identity? Because it feels like this is a question that's come up in a broader sense with people. I think mostly because of what's been going on with Brexit after the EU referendum a few years ago. And I feel like a lot of people from the north, from Northern Ireland, from Ulster, are reassessing their identity because I know I certainly have in the past few years I was just wondering if in a very personal sense because there is so much that you have talked a bit about I suppose practices that could be considered as traditional Irish practices but what even does that mean and um, what kind of tradition you know there's a lot of question marks that come up from that but I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that or if that was part of what you were working through as well it isn't really Again, it kind of links back to what we were talking about earlier, and that idea of human response to grief in relation to the Keenan. I work under my Irish title, and there's a lot of Irish themes, but for me they're just human responses and human things, and I think that's what they should be, to be honest. Okay. Although they have a history with Gaelic culture, these are just things that people do to uh, deal with things. I think to make it too... I'm not speaking about you, I'm just speaking generally. Uh, to make it political is the wrong thing to do. Okay. Yeah. No, that's fair. Yeah. yeah. I don't really think politics and identity, in terms of my work, I, I don't really think about it too much. At the moment, I'm just kind of working through my sort of demons and trying to almost get through them. There are a lot to do with just what I went through and after that. But politics, society and all that, I think it, it does make its way into your work one way or another, I guess. If I'm speaking about hospital environments, mm -hmm. maybe something can be said about the lack of beds or things like that to the NHS. And I think they always find their way in somehow, but I don't really seek after a political message. I'm trying to say my own yeah. piece. So it's an idea of, in a way, maybe you have to renegotiate things with your own body because that's at the level yeah. of what you were surviving. Circling back to start it because that was the first of your films I watched yesterday was Screen and it just struck me so much and the images of it and the sounds of it particularly have stayed with me. Just that sense of 
that isolation in a very busy environment. Yeah, I think um, you might be right there. I've never really thought about that, but I guess there's a contrast there between the style and mm. it's nice to hear that. Do you have anything you want to plug? Is there anywhere on the internet you would like to direct people if they want to see your work? Sure, uh, I have a website, iana19.com, but I think I'm going to be changing that soon. Yeah, just on my YouTube probably if you're looking for my video. But okay. It's, it's all there. Yeah, it's on so my channel. Just search for your name and it's quite easy to find. I have a great SEO. <laughs> <laughs> It's been really brilliant to hear from you, to hear more about your work. I really look forward to seeing how your work progresses. Thanks for having me. Thank you and very good luck with everything. And good luck to your (laughs) mum as well for her exhibition. I will. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks very much. You've been listening to Audiovisual Cultures with me, Paula Blair, and my very special guest, Ina McKenna. This episode was recorded, edited, and produced by Paula Blair. The music is Common Ground by Airtone, licensed under a Creative Commons non-commercial 3.0 license, and is available for download on ccmixer.org. If you like what we do, please help us meet production and distribution costs with a regular payment to liberapay.com forward slash PEA Blair, or make one-off donations to paypal.me forward slash PEA Blair. Episodes are released every other Wednesday. Subscribe on your chosen app so you never miss a new release. And do remember that our backlog of episodes is all available on YouTube. Visit audiovisualcultures.wordpress.com or follow AV Cultures Pod on Instagram and AV Cultures on Twitter and Facebook for more information and useful links. Thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.